so thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I'm finishing the PhD in a few months, so I'm looking for jobs. So you think I'm <laughs> yeah, Okay. You think I fit in your company? I have yes. Right. So what the title suggests is not a surprise. So what we do is compile uh, uh, interpreted languages, dynamic languages like Python, well in, in my case Ruby and R, to OpenCL at runtime. So, let's start with the motivation. So, nowadays, today, you have plenty of hardware that you use hardware around. You have GPUs, FPGAs, Intel 5, mobile devices, and so on. So How are they programmed? Well, today, uh, normally a program is in OpenMP4, for example, OpenMPC, SQL, CUDA, and so on and so forth. What they have in common is they are programmed using C, C++ like. However, and Jeremy Singer spoiled this graph, if you look at the ranking of most, pro most uh, uh, famous programming languages now, yeah, C is one of the best, is one of the, best, is the first one, but also we have uh, like Python, R, PHP, JavaScript, Ruby, and probably much, much more. So the question now is how do you program GPUs from high level languages? A lot of people are using them. Well, uh, we have two ways right now. The first one is the external library. So imagine that you have your program written in R, but with the language you like. Um, and in the middle, you have a call to a function, a native function. So you execute that function in the terminal device, in this case with, with OpenCL on the GPU. What happens is, if you want to execute a for loop and a float to the GPU, you have to go to another way, or do another library, or extend the library. So another way is via grabbers. That means that you have your program, and in the, in the middle of your program, you provide an OpenCL, in this case, uh, sorry, in, uh, an OpenCL program. So the programmer, the user, has to know the R programming model, but also the OpenCL programming model plus the OpenCL architecture, which is the hub for most of the end users. Right, the question is, is there any other way? So what I propose is, could be any way that automatically we can compile, or we can use a GPU, without telling anything, without changing the code. So it seems trivial, but we have many challenges here. I summarize some of the challenges in this slide. So first of all, we are compiling dynamic languages. Dynamic languages, they change data type and they point with the runtime. So we need to control the, 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 all the data types we can compile. Also, uh, it's an important question. We are targeting GPUs, for example, or other kind of hardware, because we want to speed up the program. But if, if we have to control all the possible paths that a high-level program has, you introduce an overhead. I will expand this idea later on. So one of the key is how to reduce that overhead. But also we have other issues, other challenges, how to actually generate code, how to perform optimizations. And one very important question is how to perform de-optimizations. Uh, right, so I'm going to expand what I mean by interpreted overhead. So let's, let's see an example. A plus B. In a pick up Ruby, Python, whatever language you like. A and B that has no types, and this is the AST that corresponds uh, to that operation. Right, Let I show you a possible implementation for the plus operator. You have your value A and B, or left and right, and let's say, well, if these two values are long, execute the long. If these two values are double, execute the double. In pair, for example, you can sum the strings. If these two values are string, execute the string operation. The question is, shall we compile this to the GPU? This is full of branches, right? So ideally, we want to remove part of this over here, and we want to compile exactly what we want. So how do we do that? Uh, I use truffle and grab. So I know I'm going to explain this because Michael explained very well this morning. But basically, we use a technique called specialization and parsing evaluation. So by using a specialization, we get the correct data type. And by using parsing evaluation, we actually compile something that is very close to what we want. Still, we have some over here, as I will show you later on. So the parsing evaluation doesn't remove all the over here. Uh, so I'm not going to explain this too much because I want to focus on my what I extend to the real projects. Right? So, as I say, using parsing evaluation and specialization solves part of the problem, but still we have some issues. For example, how to generate code, how to perform optimization, or how to perform the optimization. So for this talk, I will focus on the first and the third one. So compilation and the optimization, because I don't have too much time. If you are interested in C, all the workflow, and also the, the optimization hub, 
I have a paper next week, so you can uh, read it. Right. right, so how I do the compilation. So here's an overview of my compiler framework. Uh, at the top is an uh, R program and Ruby program, the equivalent R and Ruby programs. And what I do is, well, first of all, the gray squares represent my contribution to the existing projects. So that's why, that's how I extend it. You know? uh, the components that I include to enable OpenCL compilation. So what I do is, less I don't modify the language. I don't provide, I don't provide any extension. So what I do is, okay, let's look at the program and see if there is something that I can realize. In R, for example, we have apply functions that, that correspond to the map parallel skeleton, and the same in Ruby. So we get that, and we represent these operations in a new node in the AST. That node in the AST, I run sequentially, but gather profiling information that I need for OpenCL later on. Then the truffle starts executing the AST interpreter, and then I provide an API that communicates the, the AST with the information I need later on. And then, with the parse evaluation, I extend the parse evaluator to include OpenCL specialization phases. I will talk on this a little bit more later on. And then finally, we get the OpenCL code. So I target in the high level languages like Ruby and R right now, and I produce C OpenCL code. So this is very abstract, so I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail what's going on inside. So here I show input, output. Input is the R program, the output is the OpenCL code. And in the middle, this is all the steps I do. So I have them apply, I have function, very simple function. This is just for illustration. You don't code this in R. Uh, and then I show you here the AST. This AST has been specialized. So in some of the nodes, it's already double, multiplication for double, addition for double. And here I show you the Graal IR, the intermediate representation. So the parsing evaluation, the output is an intermediate representation, the Graal IR form. And I show you here the Graal IR that corresponds with one of the nodes, just to illustrate. So what I do here is red value, I meaning I pass in two values to the function, and I read in the first one. And reading the first one, what they're doing, I, I, I think it's a bit hard to read, but it's doing an instance of, so it's checking that the value is double, instead of double. If it's not double, I have to deopt. Otherwise, continue the program. However, this is actually <coughs> additional information. This is over here for me. Why? Because the CPU and the GPU has different memories. I have to allocate the buffers before. I have to, turn, I have to copy element by element before running the program. So I know the data type is double. Right? So this, is, this information can be removed. Also, the checks like is null and is confused because the GPU doesn't support a null pointer, for example, or pointers. So what I did is I extend the truffle interpreter, so the truffle DSL, with a few annotations. In this case, I include non-type that I put to the function frame, and by doing that, in the parsing evaluation step, I can say, ah, you're targeting GPU, you don't need a check for the input value because the annotation is non-type. So we can simplify a lot the graph after parsing evaluation. So we can simplify even more. And then by doing some simplifications, we get this very simple graph, just an example. And at the end, we do a visitor that traverse all the nodes in IR and produce the OpenCL code. That's the compilation, and then we use a driver to compile the binary code and we it in a cache. So if you have the same function again, you just use the binary in the cache. That's the high level overview of the compilation. And then uh, I'm going to show you the deoptimization process. Um, I'm going to show you with an example. This, this is the workflow, a typical workflow for a deoptimization. And here is an example written in R. So it's a very simple function. If the value is less than 1, return 0, otherwise return 1. So we to play with uh, speculation, right? Imagine that in some point, the vector, the input, de the input data, is full of zero. So you, the profiler will tell you, ah, you only <coughs> took this branch. You never took this one. But then we do the JIT and we, we are unlucky, the first value is actually different than zero. So what we do, well, we have a speculation there, we go, we do the interpretation, profiling, parsing evaluation, and we generate the code. And this is what the GPU code looks like. So this is the OpenCL code uh, for the function. We pass the value, and also we pass a flag, a buffer, to DOT. 
we check the condition, and if the condition is happens, so it means that I miss a branch, I put a flag to one. <coughs> and then at runtime, when this is the situation where I have to run the application, I have to run all the threads on the GPU. The GPU doesn't support traps or exception, so there is no way to stop. Right? But at runtime, I can check the flag and say, well, there was a flag to one, I have to deopt. So what I have, what I do is the optimization happen and I start the reinterpretation again, the profiling, parsing evaluation, and finally the new uh, OpenCL code. In this case, just is the complete code. Right? Uh, as far as I know, there is no other project that performs the optimization in GPU. Uh, well, this is a good thing, but also we have some limitations. For example, in in the case of Ruby and R, we only support the common data types, means integers, double, list, booleans. We don't support any kind of objects. For example, in R, it could be good to support data frames. It is very useful. But we don't support now, uh, that for now. Also, we have for the kind of limitation. It's not a limitation for R, but it's a limitation for other languages. For example, the function you compile, I don't allow side effects. <coughs> but in, in R, it's fine. But in Ruby, uh, it's not legal, so I'm breaking the semantic. I need to deal with that. Also, I don't support with mixed data types. So if your output is always integer, it's going to be always integer. In Ruby, in R, it's, it's OK. But in Ruby, you can mix data types. That's a limitation. Anyway, I'm going to show you some results. Um, these are for R language. The x-axis shows a different benchmark. I have eight. Y axis shows speed up, a speed up over what? Over the R implementation of Oracle, fast R. It's not even Gini UR. Right? So the first part is Gini UR. If you are version, you have to do a laptop. The second is the fast R version. The third one is my fast R version with the GPU compilation, the GPU compilation. And the last bar shows the native code, the OpenCL C this version. So um, here in average, uh, Fast R is 10 times faster than the uh, new R. Well, that's good. And my version is 150 times faster than Fast R. It's 1,000 times faster than new R just to perform the complete open safety complete. And in average, it's 1.8 slow down compared to C++, which is quite good, I think. It's quite good. We are very close. Also, Ruby project is, is work in progress. I show you the results I have. Well, I have a few more, but it's not complete yet. Uh, we have similar speedups. Again, in this case, our baseline is harder because JRuby is faster than FastR. That's what we compare. And I can tell you the difference between my version and the native code is still 2x slow down. So we are in the same order. We are in the same value. Right? Yeah, this ju is just imitating the techniques we did for the R project. Uh, yeah, so as I was as a takeaway, so I show you how to do JIT compilation for R and Ruby languages. As far as I know, as far as we know, uh, this is the first OpenCL JIT compiler for dynamic languages. No one has performed that. I say automatic compilation because other people with annotations in the language obviously can do JIT compilation. Uh, I'll show you a technique how, how to compile and how to de optimize. So again, if you're interested in the optimization we have, feel free to ask me. For work in progress, we would like to, to introduce JavaScript language, I think would be very interesting. And also multi-GPU. Indeed, this is done. So it's transparently, you can run on two or three GPUs automatically with R. Uh, and I'm interesting, what I'm proposing is a common interface that the language implemented just imports and you get the OpenCLG compilation for free. That's why I'm targeting different languages and see the common parts. Still, this is work in progress. And yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say. So, thank you very much. If you have any questions. Yes? So, how do you decide which version of the code to upload to the GPU? Right. So, we don't do auto parallelization. What we did is, uh, the existing languages, the high level languages, the dynamic half primitive in the language that they correspond to parallel semantics. In R, there is the supply. The supply is parallel. That means that you pass a function over an input vector, right? And you execute that, fun that function for every input in the vector. 
That means that you don't have any data dependency and that corresponds with the map panel skeleton on the GPU. That's the best case for the GPU. That's why we pick up if apply like variants. So you're using variants. the language constructs, not. Well, we take advantage of the language construct that exists in the, already in the language, right? Okay. So we don't modify them. And also for uh, uh, Ruby, but also for Perl, Python, you have the map primitive, or similar thing like that, map primitives. Yeah. I think this is nice to Even if you identify um, embarrassingly parallel pure functions saying right, we're going to optimize these, um, there still might be an issue where the input data is so small that you don't need to get the overhead of the offload. How do you uh, get around that? You can uh, slow the thing down, you know, if you're trying to parallelize it. Yeah, assuming I can parallelize you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I didn't show you this, but it's a good point. So let me show you another graph which I include all the overhead. This is a hard to read, but I explain. So this is the number of seconds that takes the R application to run the application, the runtime. And the y-axis is the speed up I have on two GPUs. So that means that it's hard to read, but I can tell you around three seconds of R execution on CPU is worth to switch to the GPU. Obviously, if you run less than that, meaning data, right? Yeah. Uh, don't switch. But for long runs, obviously, uh, the speed up is very high. So that's quantifying the overhead, right? Uh, that this includes everything because I, this is not JIT compilation. I, this is when you start your program, including data transfer, interpretation, JIT compilation, and everything. Thanks. Everything. Yeah. And so is that very constant for all those programs? Uh, so this, this is the arguments I use for the other. Is, is that because we have needs to warm up and to get the optimizing compiler to pick in? Everything is included yeah. here, yes. Uh, so I think German's question was a bit different. He was asking what about you make an optimization decision where you offload only a, a, a short code snippet on the GPU. It doesn't happen in anything. That's what I'm trying to say. So if you don't execute, if your application doesn't run long enough, well, uh, it's sort of a long running application. How many kernel calls are there in there? That's what we're going to know, I think. So right. how, many, how many calls do maps you make in each one? One, yeah. just one. Just one. Okay. 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 Just does that make sense? So the data set scaled with the yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So each point, this is the data size is the same ten. So this is twenty and so on and so forth. Right. Obviously if you don't if your data set is not big enough, mm -hmm. your execution on CPU is gonna be super fast, it doesn't make any sense to switch to the GPU, but in some point the speed up are quite high. In the case of DFD on body, it's like 60 times faster. So, do you actually do some sort of cost uh, analysis to determine whether dynamically, determine dynamically whether it makes sense to upload or not? Uh, no, I assume it can be a float. I try to float. Yeah, that's going to be a other problem. So, assume sufficiently intensive programmer. So, just for completeness, and I'm not sure if you would consider it super, you know, automatic enough uh, translation. Uh, we did something similar when I was at Adobe when we uh, actually translated a portion of a um, subset of actions of action script to OpenCL. And we had this basically dynamic system where you profiled for a little bit and sort of tried to measure the cost of offloading to a specific GPU because we tested it with both on die GPUs and, and discrete uh, cards and sort of decide whether it makes sense to run it in OpenCL on the CPU where you don't really pay the cost of transferring the data or it actually makes sense to. Uh, of the GPU, so this could yeah, probably yeah. complement. That's a good point, but this work is once you have identify the parallelization, you have the issue how do you generate code for a higher level language? Yes, see, all the issues are there, right? I'm just saying it's a, yeah. a complementary, so to Yes, I think that I mean. Yeah. So, what kind of data then do you support? Suppose you have a map, map function uh, to your problem, offloading. Uh, I think it's sending a data, just that, you know. If it's arrays to uh, GPU memory, is is straightforward. But if a uh, you know object re receiver object is more complicated object, what happens? Uh, so what we did is obviously we support the primitive types, but also we support combination make we like list in R. List <coughs> becomes a tuple, and tuple you have an array of arrays. So we can support these things. We can not support, for example, data frames if you refer to that. So more complicated types. Uh, but we can combine in that. For example, in Embody, you pass a table of nine elements, I think. Each one is an array, and so on. Yeah. Ed? Yeah, have you considered adding annotations so that you can say, can identify more explicitly things which he or she knows can be parallelized? You mean in the user code? Yeah. No. 
we, we don't want to add anything in the input language. We, we don't want the user, the, the user wants, I want this faster, I don't care how. So the VN should figure out the, the best way to do it. That, we consider that, but no, we don't want that. We don't uh, modify input program. I just wonder how many sites you can really identify as being obviously parallelizable. We haven't done the study. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't want to modify. That's a restriction we have. Mm -hmm. What we did is we include or we extend annotation in the Truffle DSL. They are extended to other platforms, if you like, to, in, to the language implementer. So the language implementer should annotate the frame, non-type. If you execute with OpenCL, this variable is non-type, don't do the check because it's going to be cheaper. You don't have to do the check on GPU. That kind of question, that kind of thing, yes. Annotation, but for the language implementer. Okay. Now, one question from Stefan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because R and Ruby, they are two very fundamental, fundamentally different languages and people program very differently. And yeah. So, I mean, my understanding is your framework is supposed to be language agnostic. Yes. But I guess, I believe, you actually would need to have language specific uh, facilities in those things. With annotation, I mean. We no, kind of, for instance, I mean, in, in R, more or less the standard code you write is like picture. Okay. And really it's not. Uh, well, we try to, what we did for Ruby is we report the benchmark we did for the R. And so that's we have why, side code. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I say we have this limitation. We are breaking this. We need to solve this in the future. Yeah. Um, we've gone ahead to stop yet. I uh, just wanted to have the next uh, presenter set up. Uh, so if there are any more questions, we still have time. Yeah? So have you thought about uh, using the GPU for what it's good at, uh, like data visualization? Like uh, binding that into the language because you now have tons of data on the GPU. Mm -hmm. uh, visualizing it should be uh, also nice. If you can write it in the host language, that would even be better. Yeah, yeah. Well, we haven't investigated visualization tools yet, but yeah, it could be um, could it also machine learning algorithms as well. Yeah. Yes. 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 It's hard for me at least to pick up because we start with the R project and it was hard to select the R benchmark because there are no R benchmark benchmark for visualization. Or at least I didn't find it. It's, it was quite hard. So what I did is okay, this is the benchmark people use for GPUs, let's port it. And now we are working with the guys in our labs to try, okay, this benchmark is useful, this in Ruby is is written this way, so yeah. You know, yes. But also I agree, we should explore other kind of libraries like machine learning, visualization and so on. Yeah. Does your um, system have the facility to keep data in the GPU memory across multiple maps? Or do you always offload each time that you? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm offloading, but it's not a implementation. It's just because it could be. Yeah. Depending on the world, it could be useful. Yeah, it could be very really useful. I don't do it now, but I think with the infrastructure we have now, it's, it's going to be easy. Yeah, we have this. We can batch. So if you have more data that you can fit in GPU memory, we do perform the batch execution. Right. Uh, we split the data in chunks. Actually, the chunk is the maximum amount of number in GPU memory, and we execute the batch batches. That's what we do now. But the another feature is multi kernel and keep the, GPU, the data ready on the GPU. Yes, that's a good point. Any more questions? Well, in that case, I have one more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, the languages that you're compiling down to OpenCL, they have very interesting features, uh, you know, like variable scoping and closure and stuff like that. So, like, can you compile the whole language into OpenCL because you're attacking it at the sort of such a low level, which is, which is basically <coughs> close to the compiler video representation? Or there are limitations on what kinds of constructs other than data types you do or do not support? Yeah, there are obviously limitations. Uh, for example, SQL is a related project. It's, they, they, they do very nice work. So they got the STL, the parallel STL, and they upload to the Spark or OpenCL. So what they did is they took everything that can be that is legal in OpenCL. It is not legal of the you can know. And I'm doing the same approach. Uh, yeah, if you want performance, you have to decide. 
if you support all the features in the language or you go for the fast path and you say, this is some restrictions, as soon as you have the restrictions, it's going to be fast. No, I, I understand, um, but still, there is, there is always this trade-off yeah. between you know, expressivity yes. and performance. And so the reason I ask is that, I, again, we did something similar with ActionScript. Once we got to a subset of ActionScript that we actually supported, you can't call it ActionScript anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically C or, or whatever, right? With yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And so I, I, my question was, is it more like, do you support more, or it's basically also like, you know, for loops are supported, but you know, cloggers are not. And so basically, the, the the language itself degrades to something that's really something very simple with the syntax of the of the given. Yeah, language. well, I could write eventually in R, so travels and execute on GPU, so I get a representative you know, of. Uh, but obviously, yeah, in our data frames are everywhere. But I think uh, all the projects are doing that. So what data frames do you That's what I think. Uh, but other kind of exceptions, for example. Well, so give an example of R. Let's take it off then, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about a super uh, assignment operator that assigns uh, to variables in outer frames. We don't support that for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the <laughs> check. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much.